today we're, we've got a, a program. Uh, Leo Barron is going to talk about his book, uh, The Patent at Bastogne. And um, uh, I, uh, of course, have an interest in patent because of my name. But, uh, but it, it, it's a great story. And uh, Leo, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, buddy. Guys, can you hear me okay? Awesome. Um, uh, real quick question before we get started: How many of you here were last night? Pretty much, lotty dotty, everybody. Okay, so um, I'm not going to spend too much time on the first couple maps simply because they look, you know, rather familiar. Um, anyways. For those of you who weren't here last night, uh, we're really going to be focusing in on what's in that box there, uh, which was more or less the uh, area of operations for the U.S. Uh, 12th Army Group, and of course, Bastogne. And why does Bastogne figure this in this story? Well, that's where uh, Patton was trying to get to, was the city of Bastogne. All right. And like yesterday, this is the same app uh, many of you saw yesterday. This was the situation on the morning of 16 December. Uh, these flags actually represent uh, the Allied armies that were in their you know, current locations that morning. You had the 1st Canadian Army, 2nd uh, British Army, 9th U.S. Army, 1st uh, uh, U.S. Army, and then of course you had Patton's 3rd Army down here in the south. And like we were talking about yesterday, kind of the lay, the, 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 the framework of what was going on. These were, were the two major concentrations of Allied divisions. We're up here in the north, up by the Aachen area, and of course, down here for Third Army, which is where you know Patton had just finished taking uh, the city of Metz down here in uh, November of 1944. And that big open area where there isn't a lot of Allied divisions is, of course, the Ardennes. And that was the German plan. They were going to get through the Ardennes and get to the town of Antwerp cut the Allied armies in half, all right, and thereby lengthen the war, if not try to win the war outright. And that's what we're going to be looking at today, Patton's third army, okay? Now, just like yesterday, same slide with one slight difference, 16 December, okay? Um, 16 December, it has been discussed that most of the Allied high command was caught unawares, caught flat-footed. Uh, that is not entirely true. Uh, there were people in the intelligence community that had actually predicted, predicted not completely predicted this, this German offensive, but had laid it out as a potential uh, possibility. Uh, one of those men was a guy by the name of Colonel Oscar Koch. Uh, he was the G2 for Patton's Third Army. And he is, even today, he's kind of considered uh, one of the major patriarchs of the U.S. military intelligence community. You go to Fort Huachuca, uh, which is where I work, um, you'll see that you know, a lot of what Colonel Oscar Koch had, had put into doctrine still exists today. And prior to the 16th of December, uh, Colonel Oscar Koch was actually having meetings uh, with uh, the Third Army staff, and he had sat there, and as a good intel officer, he was keeping track of all, uh, of all the German divisions. Don't worry about it. I get my phone rings all the time. <laughs> He's in for two times. It's okay. Um, uh, they had been sitting there, and there were all these German divisions that all of a sudden had vanished. And of course, as we know, they don't just vanish. Uh, and Colonel Koch was wondering where they had gone to. And the ones that he was really concerned about were the Panzer Divisions, because Panzer Divisions, you have Panzer Divisions for offensive operations. You typically have your infantry divisions for your defensive operations. And the Panzer Divisions were no longer on the German front line. They had disappeared. And we actually did, do, we did actually talk to the Russians, and we also knew that they weren't on the Eastern Front. And so now the, you know, the million dollar question was, you know, where did they go? And most of the people in the Allied High Command, especially in the intel community, uh, 
really were kind of like, well, you know, it doesn't really matter. This war is over with. It's winding down. And they were just kind of discounting uh, the fact that, you know, where these panzer, di panzer divisions had disappeared to. Well, Colonel Koch had sat there and started to do the math and said, okay, I'm looking at, at this point, there are around 10 to 15 German divisions, a lot of them which are panzer divisions, that are unaccounted for. We don't know where they're at. They've disappeared off the, the various positions along the eastern and western front or the Italian front. And 10 to 15 divisions, as we like to call, is a lot of combat power. What are the Germans planning to do with this combat power? Um, and Koch believed that it was more important not just to look at, as an intel officer, not just to look at the enemy's intentions, but it was even more important to look at the enemy's capabilities. What is he capable of doing? And that's what we do today, is what we train our intel officers. We're not just looking at what is his intentions, what is his objective and end state, but what is he also capable of doing? Because once you figure that out, then you can look at it and say, well, what's his most dangerous course of action? And at this time, most of the intel officers were not looking at the most dangerous course of action. They were looking at, well, what is the German intention? And of course, you know, they could not get into the mind of Adolf Hitler. They were thinking as Western, they were thinking of U.S. Army as British Army officers, and they basically were saying, this war is over with. Why are they even fighting? They're not going to do anything else. You know, they might as well just pack up their bags and leave. They were not looking at what was the German Army at this time capable of doing. And so right around December 9th, 12th time frame, uh, Patton was having meetings with his staff. They were getting ready. Patton was getting ready to do an offensive operation into the Saar Valley that was supposed to kick off on the 19th of December. And Koch had sat there and brought it to him and said, hey, sir, General Patton, I think we've got a problem here. We've got all these unaccounted for German divisions, and this could be a real issue if we, when we kick off this offensive on 19 December. Really, why it's going to be an issue is because if this offensive would be down here in the southern part of the map, the Germans then could counterattack from that area and basically hit us in the flank. And so Patton, being a good general, trusted his staff, said, okay, that's, you, you've sold me. Okay, I realize that this could be a problem. Let's put some contingency plans together so that if this does actually become an issue, we'll be prepared for it. Well, as we all know now, on 16 December, three German armies, you know, opened up a huge attack, uh, roughly 20, it turned out to be 22 divisions, not, uh, you know, 15 divisions, 22 divisions, and all those panzer divisions all of a sudden suddenly showed up here along the west wall, and now we knew what was going on. So three German armies broke through the Allied lines. And of course, their intermediate objectives, like we were talking about yesterday, were the towns of St. Vith and Bastogne. And to Eisenhower's credit, like we were talking about last night, uh, on the eve of the 16th, he knew there, there was something going on. He knew this was not some spoiling attack. He knew it was a major German offensive. And so as a result of that, he made some orders and started issuing orders. On the 19th of December, there's this famous meeting uh, in the town of Verdun. And Eisenhower brings in all the key players, one of which being uh, General Patton. And this meeting is important because it pretty much set the tone, but also laid out the overall objectives more or less for the next month uh, in Northwest Europe. And Eisenhower's goal was simple. He wanted to lock down the shoulders, so thereby limiting the penetration. And then as soon as possible, he then wanted to counterattack from both the north up here and the south. And as we now know, the North uh, was going to be led by the 21st uh, Army Group, which was under the command of uh, General Montgomery, well, Free Marshal Montgomery, all right. And the Southern uh, attack was going to be spearheaded by Patton's Third Army, coming up here from the South, okay. And I think uh, the Patton movie actually does a very good job of replaying that scene uh, in, the, in the, uh, the barracks in Verdun. It was actually in an old World War I barracks. And there was, it was actually a, it was a very Spartan room. Um, and all the, the only source of heat was like a, an old uh, iron stove that they had in the corner of the room. And Eisenhower walks in there. 
And Eisenhower was an eternal optimist and said, I don't want to see any, you know, paraphrasing, but he goes, I don't want to see any hat, you know, sad faces here. I want to only hear, you know, good news. And Patton, of course, jumps right onto that. And, you know, it, Patton even says uh, in his, in the, uh, the, the uh, semi-autobiography that was written after the war from his letters that uh, it kind of electrified uh, the room. Because at, prior to that point, as intel officers are wont to do when they get caught with their pants down, the immediate the pendulum swings. They immediately went from being overly optimistic to overly pessimistic, and uh, you know, the sky is falling. I mean, being a former intel guy, I, I know how that works, because <laughs> you're like, I don't want to get caught again. So everything's going wrong. Cats and dogs living together. It's anarchy, uh, gloom and doom. Okay, um, and so that's what's going on. And uh, Eisenhower immediately uh, lifts uh, the mood of the room. And of course, like I said, Patton, uh, in colorful Patton language, um, you know, he basically says, you know, you know, the crowd has stuck his neck out, and I'm basically going to put it into a meat grinder and crush him. Okay, and it was colorful language. And so, as the meeting goes on, and, and they they come to the realization that the counterattack from the north is going to take a lot of time. They had, they don't have the necessary combat power uh, in the north. Uh, it was the Germans were really pressing hard. As we know, that is where their decisive op originally was from the six, Pets, six SS Panzer Army. That's where Camp Group Piper was coming through, and so the north was under a lot of strain. And uh, they realized the best place for a counterattack would be from the south. And just like it's shown in the movie, uh, when they ask. General Patton, how long is it going to take you to turn your guys around, do a 90 degree turn with Third Army, and start to head north? And Patton, of course, says 48 hours. And when he said that, uh, there were a, comp you know, a couple you know, chortles and a lot of guffaws, like, <laughs> you're not going to be able to do that. Um, and a lot of looks of disbelief, the rolling of eyeballs. And Patton, of course, you know, goes on to prove them wrong. He does get Third Army turned around in 48 hours. And um, the reason why he was able to do that is simply because of the fact that his intel guys and his staff had already paired, prepared contingency plans for this. They were the ones not caught flat-footed. They were the ones that understood that this was going to be a problem at some point. And thereby, when Patton literally walked out of the meeting, okay, it was at a big, uh, it was an old, uh, it was the uh, Luxembourg, um, railway headquarters in Luxembourg City uh, after, no, excuse me, it was, this is in Verdun. The Luxembourg headquarters is something else. This is in Verdun. He walks out of the building, and all he does is he gets on the radio, and he says one word to his staff, and the word is nickel. And the staff had already pre-planned that when he hears that word, they knew, all right, when we hear that word, this is the plan that we're going to have to go into, and they, they take off with that plan, all right, which, of course, Oscar Koch had already identified the three potential avenues of approach of how they wanted to get up uh, to the bulge. And they decided that this was the best avenue of approach. Basically, to go from the town of Arlon to the south, up through Bastogne, and then to keep on going through and to cut off uh, the German bulge. More or less, not quite at the point over here, but pretty much in the middle. And the reason why they chose that was because of the road network, the availability of hardball roads, north-south roads, because there actually are not a lot of north-south roads uh, in this area. And so that's why they chose that. Now, this is where the book takes a different tact. Um, there are a lot of books on Patton. Uh, there's a lot of great biographies. Uh, uh, you know, Carlo Dess' uh, biography is a great book. Um, there's also a lot of great books uh, on the Battle of the Bulge, uh, Time for Trumpets, um, John Tolan's book. And what I wanted to do was to kind of set the stage in the first half of the book with the Allied High Command, the German High Command, for instance, and what were they thinking. But pretty much from about the halfway point on, I actually look at the actual division that was charged with the mission of reaching Bastogne. And that, of course, was the 4th Armored Division. And the reason why I chose the 4th Armored Division was, one, they were the ones that broke through to Bastogne. But there's also a lot of great stories uh, with the 4th Armored Division. And even way back when, when I first started working with Don 
on writing No Silent Night, I always understood that this was going to be a two-part story. Um, a lot of people know about the 101st, and you know, you can't blame them. As a, as a member of the 101st myself, it's, it is the greatest division of all time. And you know, uh, um, as a screaming eagle, I can. It makes a lot of sense. But there's also the famous story where uh, the, the German emissaries go out to see General McAuliffe and they ask him to surrender. And of course, as we all know now, uh, General McAuliffe tells him nuts. And the German commander goes, well, what does that mean? And of course, Colonel Harper, as he's walking away, said, actually, what it really means is go to hell. And so you can't beat that. It's a great story. But the reality of it is, is that when you have a siege, you're going to have the besieged, the besiegers, but you're also going to have the relief force. There's always, always going to be a relief force. And in this case, the relief force was the 4th Armored Division. And so I always felt that that was a story that kind of got short shrift. And the more I studied about the story, the more I realized that it really had a story all of its own and that it could stand on its own. Um, and so that's why I was always thinking about when I was putting the research together uh, that I knew I was going to write this book. And so I needed to obviously set up the context and bring in the whole patent thing. But I really wanted to also focus in on uh, the 4th Armored Division. And I have a confession to make. When I, put, when I pitched the idea to the publisher, because uh, people asked me, you know, how come you don't say 4th Armored Division in the title? Um, because honestly, it, no, not too many people know about the 4th Armored Division. And so the publisher was like, well, you got to put Patton in the title because Patton sells. And I was like, all right, fine, we'll put Patton in the title. But it really is as much about Patton as it is about the 4th Armored Division. And, uh, and there are a lot of famous people who came out of the 4th Armored Division. Uh, most of you here are probably familiar with the M1 Abrams tank. Okay, Abrams was named after Creighton Abrams. Creighton Abrams was the battalion commander who led the final push that actually broke through to Bastogne on December 26. That's pretty much how he got his claim to fame. Um, so there were a lot of other famous uh, individuals that came out of the 4th Armored Division. And so that's really what my focus was on the second half of the book. A couple other things I wanted to talk about, though, was like No Silent Night, it's a 360 degree account. Because the 4th Armored Division wasn't, you know, fighting the snow. I mean, it was fighting the snow. But it was also fighting the German army. And so, in particular, they were fighting the 5th Falschmäger Regiment. I mean, excuse me, 5th Falschmäger Division, which was comprised of three regiments, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th. And there are, are accounts on the German side that talk about what those uh, individuals were doing. Uh, Oberst, who became General Major Heilman, in the course of these events, he was the division commander of the uh, Fifth uh, Falschmjäger uh, Division, and he wrote a very lengthy account. Um, there were also several uh, soldiers who survived the war. They were uh, NCOs, junior officers, who also wrote very lengthy um, memoirs. The most famous one being was Conrad Clement, who was uh, who was an NCO in the, uh, the 9th Company of the 15th uh, Falschmjäger Regiment. It was about a 100-plus page uh, memoir of his account. And it was a very in-depth and very detailed account. Not only that, there's also, like we did with No Silent Light, there's also the villagers. What were the villagers saying? There's a, a wonderful gentleman by the name of Guy Arise who runs a website about the town of Begonville, okay, which is right here. And he has collected several accounts of local villagers who survived uh, who survived the battle and you know, basically put all their thoughts down. And then last but not least, what were the Army Air Force guys doing? And like with No Silent Night, you had the 407th uh, fighter group. And here, you had the 362nd fighter group that provided close air support. And in reality, in certain instances here, they were even more decisive in this battle than they were for the 101st. So I, I wanted to bring in all those different accounts and put it together into some kind of coherent uh, narrative. And then, of course, there's the German High Command and the American High Command. Uh, the most interesting interest character uh, is the uh, Chief of Staff um, for the 7th Army. And he was actually involved, uh, von Gersdorf, he was actually involved in the, uh, the, the various plots to kill Adolf Hitler. And for some odd reason, he never got identified. He never got fingered. Um, and so not only did he survive, <coughs> You know, he did such a good job, they kept on promoting him. Um, 
He just didn't do a good job when it came to killing Adolf Hitler. He was actually in a suicide plot. He had, there was a, uh, uh, an exposition uh, show that was in Berlin in 43, and he had actually put mines in his coat, and he was going to go up to Adolf Hitler like a suicide bomber and blow himself up. And, you know, by the fates of history, Hitler didn't go the direction he wanted him to go, and so he wasn't able to do it. So he, you know, he survived, and he ended up uh, surviving the war. Uh, so there's all these interesting characters when you put them all together. But like I said, the second half of the book really is, is really about the, uh, the Fourth Armed Division. And not only is it about the Fourth Armed Division, it's about the tank commanders, it's about the tank drivers, it's about the junior officers uh, who fought in that battle. And so, and there was actually a lot of battles. An armored division at the time was combined, it was broken up into what they call combat commands. And so in this case, you've got Combat Command A, Combat Command B, and then, of course, CCR, which is not only just a great, uh, you know, rock band. It was, uh, you guys know, it's one of my favorites, John Fogarty. Okay. <laughs> uh, CCR stands for Combat Command Reserve. And so these are basically three combined arms team. And a Combat Command typically had an armor, a tank battalion. They called them tank battalions back then. A tank battalion. Uh, an armored infantry battalion, usually some kind of artillery battalion, and then they would typically have like a company of armored combat engineers. They also might have a troop uh, from the reconnaissance, uh, the reconnaissance squadron. And so these combined armed teams then would move up, okay, and they moved up along these three avenues of approach to try to get to Bastogne. Now, you'll see here that Combat Command Reserve here was on from here from the 22nd to the 24th of December. Then what ended up happening was they then got shifted over here on the 25th of December to get into Bastogne. And the way this book is then broken up is each of these little areas where you've got these little explosions was a major battle. So they were actually pretty busy uh, for about five days, starting on the 22nd. And Patton was true to his word. He said, I was going to be there in 48 hours. And at, on the 22nd of December is when he, you know, was when he basically began his attack from the city of Arlon. Unfortunately, the Germans wanted to kind of throw off his schedule a little bit. You know, they didn't want him to get to Bastogne for Christmas. And so for five days, they slogged it out in all these various little towns here. And it was very costly. And one of the reasons why it was costly was the way an armored division was set up, they had only three infantry battalions. And if you were one of those guys and it was one of those three infantry battalions, let's put it in perspective. Your standard U.S. Army Infantry Division had nine infantry battalions. A paratrooper unit had even more than that. Uh, you had the glider uh, infantry battalions as well as the, uh, the regular uh, paratrooper infantry battalions. So you had nine infantry battalions in your standard infantry division. An armored division had only three infantry battalions. So anytime you got into a fight, you really only had three battalions that you could choose from. And so you could believe that the turnover rate in those armored infantry battalions was rather severe because the casualty rates were astronomical. And so as a result of that, um, right around about the 24th and 25th, uh, General Gaffey, who was the division commander of the 4th Armored, realized he was basically running out of infantry. And so they ended up having to take several infantry battalions from the 80th Infantry Division, and they attached him to these combat command uh, units. And the reason why that's important is when you get to the Battle of Chaumont, which was a, more or less a several-day battle, uh, Paul Wiesdorfer was a guy from uh, 2nd Battalion of the 318th who ended up winning the Medal of Honor outside of the town of Chaumont. Okay? So it's kind of interesting. He was technically part of you know, the 4th Armored Division, because he fell under that command, but he was a 318th guy from the 318th Infantry, which was part of the 80th Infantry Division. And then, of course, on December 20 the 6th, late in the afternoon, is when they actually broke through up here in the town of Assinois. Okay? And that was Creighton Abrams' guys. All right? Now, what I would like to do is give you guys a chance to to answer a lot of questions. I didn't want to do that much of a presentation time soon because a lot of what we did, we already talked about last night. I just want to give you some context as to what was happening here. But I want to give you, the audience, the chance to pepper me with questions. Give me, give me I would like to hear, answer as many questions as I possibly can. 
So go ahead. Well, uh, one of the things that I would like to uh, have you comment on, uh, I, did any of you attend the program we did probably 10 years ago, 12, maybe 17 years ago? <laughs> we had. I was uh, in high school. <laughs> <laughs> we got some old timers okay. here. Uh, Don Bussey, did any of you attend that program? Don Bussey, who was a poker player of Harold Deutsch at Carlisle, Pennsylvania during the War College tenure for Harold, was the ultra officer for the Seventh Army. Okay, all right. And Don Bussey stood at this platform, whenever it was, and he talked about uh, the the ultra messages that mm -hmm. they were reading that there were units disappearing from uh, from the German uh, order of battle that was opposing the seventh army <clears throat> and the, the one thing that he said we didn't know where they were going which parallels exactly what you're saying but that you, you were talking about uh, more of the third army uh, G uh, G2. One of the other things that Don said is that Patton, more than probably any other commander in the American side, kept his ultra officer right by his side. Did the two for the Third Army and the ultra officer, uh, can you talk about that relationship? Did, was that something that you were exposed to? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh and honestly, I'd have to do a little bit more research. I, I've gotten, um, I was able to get a lot of uh, Koch's notes um, from uh, the Center of Military History. And what I found was um, he had looked at, and it was just a simple case of math, and, and looking at, he's like, all these Panzer divisions have suddenly disappeared. And, you know, it's interesting because you can see all his maps. He had basically all these maps that tracked where all the German units were. And he had a big, huge map that he had in his headquarters. And so, and he would list all the German divisions that they could not account for. And he basically would update this map time and time again. And he started to look at it and say, okay, especially like I said, in the first weeks of December, going, where are all these Panzer divisions? And then why are they not on the Russian front? Why are they not over here uh, on the American front? And so he started to look at, and then he started looking at certain Panzer divisions. Uh, you know, 17th SS Panzer Division, which was one of, which ironically had nothing to do uh, with this, the area up here, but it was more, 17th SS was more down towards uh, um, 7th Army's area. Uh, but he was looking at other ones like 2nd Panzer Division. He started doing the math and said, okay, these guys have been out off the line now for several months. What are they going to be able to do in several months? Well, if they're off the line for seven months, that means they're going to be able to refit their tanks. They're going to be able to retrain their crews. They're going to be able to replace crews. And, and, and as it turns out, he was actually pretty accurate in figuring out what divisions were going to be the most combat ready when this whole thing uh, kicked off on the 16th. Um, in terms of his relationship with the ultra, ultra guy, I don't remember seeing that much about it. I'm sure there was, but maybe he didn't write a lot about it because, some, because it was such a, even in the 1950s, that stuff was still classified. And so he probably didn't even put it down on paper. Um, for well, that, th th that is one of the things that uh, uh, Harold died, I think, in 1995, and he made the point, uh, and, and I actually, actually, I just wrote uh, uh, a supplement to an article that's going to be published here. Uh, Harold said that the history of World War II needed to be rewritten because uh, w winter bottom... Uh, he, he revealed Ultra in... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, with the, uh, the, uh, the, the Ultras. Yeah. The Ultra, whatever. Yeah, I know the book you're talking book about. Book I'm yeah. talking about. But that was, and that was all from memory. Yep. And, and Harold made the point that uh, the history of World War II really needs to be rewritten with the taint of what Ultra was known, yeah, what Ultra what was, was used. Yeah, and they do, there is, a, um, we do talk about, especially, uh, you know, some of the later books on the bulge, they do talk about why were the allies caught flat-footed. And one of the big reasons why was uh, we had grown increasingly reliant on the ultra-decrypts. 
And so as a result of that, if it didn't make it through the Enigma machine, it didn't make it into the Ultra reports, then it just didn't happen. And the reason why there was such a problem in the bulge was because of the fact that Hitler, and they're never really going to be quite sure, but Hitler knew something was wrong. He didn't think that his Enigmas had been broken, but he did feel like there were some kind of security leaks. And so a lot of the, the communication was done by hand couriers um, and uh, literally like guys, couriers bringing messages back and forth. And so a lot of the SIGINT traffic, which was what we call it today in our military, signals intelligence traffic, just wasn't there like it was in other uh, German operations. And so as a result of that, there was a lot of, well, you know, Ultra doesn't say anything, so wherefore, why should we be all that concerned? Uh, when in fact, there was all kinds of human intelligence, imagery intelligence, that indicated there were a lot of things going on. Uh, that we have a lot of, uh, there was a lot of uh, imagery intelligence of overflights of the railheads uh, along Trier and those areas showing all kinds of rail traffic that was coming in with a much higher volume. Uh, that was one thing. There was uh, communications traffic about the shifting of Luftwaffe units that they were getting. Uh, that was you know, going on. And then, of course, the human traffic. And the most famous one being, it was literally like only about, I think it was about 48, 72 hours before the actual thing kicked off when they, uh, the 109th Infantry Regiment, part of the 28th Infantry Division, uh, found Elise Deal, who was a Luxembourg woman, and brought her in for questioning. And she looked and said, okay, you know, I've seen all these German vehicles, you know, because she had basically been going back and forth the Our River and uh, had been moving between lines. And the Germans had captured her and brought her back, and then she escaped. But she reported to the, uh, the uh, guys in the 109th Infantry and then subsequently in the 28th Infantry Division cells, I'm seeing bridge laying equipment. And from a military perspective, that's huge. The only reason why you've got bridging equipment is if you plan on going on offensive operations. All right, if you're going on the defense, why would you need bridges? You know, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Because you're, you're going to be blowing the bridges. You're not going to need to be build the bridges. But if you know you're going to be going on offensive operations, you're going to move all your bridging equipment as close as possible to the front lines. And that's what Elise Deal saw. And that information did get sent up. And for whatever reason, people just kind of discounted it. And, 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 and It was getting close to Christmas, right? That was probably, you laugh, but that was probably a huge thing. And people were like, eh, you know. Well, and, and one of the other things, uh, one of the trips I made over uh, with actually with Jim Renner, um, we went to the little town of Kilberg, which is near Bitburg, mm -hmm. and uh, I spent a couple of days with uh, uh, a friend's, uh, oh, his name is Otto, the Panzer officer, and he drove me around the Kilberg, and that was the seventh, uh, the, the, the Southern Army. Mm -hmm. Uh, he, he drove me around and showed all the tunnels and he explained to me that what the Germans did is uh, during the daytime they would put these uh, railroad trains full of tanks into the tunnels and then they would move them out and put them on sidecars at night so that they couldn't be observed from air and, and then they'd, they'd uh, be you know transporting transporting railroad vehicles so it's uh, uh, there, there were a lot of indications. You know, I, I was trying to find it on my phone, but uh, Don Bussey actually wrote an article, I think it was 1989 in Military History magazine, and it's about, it's actually about this, uh, I, 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 I felt so badly, there were, I'd done a lot of research on the, the topic of last evening, and having Don Bussey here and having that article, and I couldn't find any of that stuff in preparation oh. for, for Leo and Don coming uh, for this presentation. Okay. Are there any other questions? Can you just briefly explain, uh, in your point, what's ULTRA and what's an ULTRA officer? Um, ULTRA, okay, there was, the Germans used something called the Enigma machine, and it looks like a typewriter. Um, and had these little rotor things. The Ultra was the code name that we used to say that we had broken through, and so it was like the Ultra project. 
And so it was all, and there was a lot of things that fell underneath that. There was our own, we had our own computers. Uh, Alan Turing, who is the famous British scientist, they just had a movie come out about him. He was a British scientist who basically used the early, you know, early forms of rudimentary computers to help break uh, the German code. And this all fall, fell under the ultra code name. And we still do that today. We have these innocuous names that we use so we can talk about it and play conversation and say, okay, hey, you know, you hear about, you know, uh, the Red Bull guy or something. And really, Red Bull means some crazy, you know. <laughs> uh, anyways, and so that's, that's, that's just how we do. That's a nomenclature that we use. John, what was your premise in understanding that? Now, what was your premise for Dr. Deutsch saying that World War II history needed to be rewritten vis-a-vis? Because so many of the decisions were made on ultra uh, events. By, by reading the German, and, and I want to, I want to, you obviously did not attend our November <laughs> of, 19, of 2013 program where we had David Kahn, who wrote the 1100 page book on Ultra. <laughs> I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but, but go on our webpage. If, if you don't know this, we've been asking for donations. We're putting our programs on YouTube. And this is program number 27-4. It's on YouTube, and you can hear David Kahn. Uh, he gave a very brief uh, presentation, yeah. but we had a tremendous number of questions. And, I mean, he is the true expert of, uh, of ultra in that, that part of the German part. Was the European? It ma yes, it ma exactly. Ma and magic exactly. was the Japanese. That's a, that's a great point. Ultra, the German magic was the Japanese coding systems. You had a question. Yeah, I have a couple questions. What? It, it, it seems historically that we've been caught. We collectively were caught flat-footed three mm -hmm. times because nobody believed anybody could go through the Ardennes. Right. And they did it in. 1914, and they did it in 1940. Why, why did they think that the Arden was immune? Well, you know, ironically, um, in the end, uh, Bradley and Eisenhower, who had made the strategic decision to only put several, four divisions there, proved to be accurate. Um, it was, at this point, too severely restrictive. Because uh, in 1940, it was in May. And of course, in 1914, it was in August. Uh, in November and December of 1944, it's muddy. Um, you really are going to be roadbound. And the theory was, if the Germans did try to do something there, a few divisions would slow them down enough to allow for the reinforcements to come in. And guess what? That's exactly pretty much what happened. Uh, especially when you look at the 110th Infantry Regiment uh, for the 28th Infantry Division. It took on, more or less, the entire 47th Panzer Corps. Okay, that's ridiculous odds. And it did enough to slow down that 47th Panzer Corps to allow uh, all the follow-on forces, one, of course, being the 101st Airborne Division, as well as uh, Combat Command B of 10th Armored. And the reason being was you can't get off the road. So if I put a couple guys manning a roadblock, okay, you're not going to get around it. You still got to go through it. And you're talking minutes, hours, and that starts to build up. And so the end result was the terrain, coupled with the dogged determination of a few isolated pockets of American defenders, was able to do what it needed to do and slow down the German advance just enough to allow for the reinforcements to show up. And that's pretty much what happened there. Okay. And my, my other question is, there, we have one, one army group, one army, mm -hmm. the third army sitting in the south, who was able to turn around and do this. And by count, there were there were at least two, if not four, armies to the north. Yeah, uh, the reason why uh, seemed to be unable to. Yeah, there was a couple reasons. One, um, first army was the one that bore the brunt of the initial uh, German penetration, um, and so they were the ones that were kind of reeling. Uh, second army, the Canadian army, they were too far out to the west, so they weren't going to be involved. So now you're really looking at. 9th Army and 1st British Army. 9th Army was not a very large army. It was actually the smallest of all the armies. And it did actually shift some forces. Uh, and then, of course, you had the, uh, the, British, uh, uh, the British Army 
that was up there in the north. And they did actually eventually play a role. And that's why uh, Montgomery was appointed the overall commander. Even though the, still the majority of the lion's share of the fighting was going to be done by U.S. troops, there were British units uh, that were involved, that were sent down. Like 30th Corps, if I remember correctly, was the one that was sent down uh, to defend the Meuse River from, from the British Army. But the other reality of it was, was that because Patton was already preparing for an offensive operation, his guys had already gotten the fuel that they needed, the class five, which is ammunition, ready to go. And so it was an understanding it would be easier for Patton to disengage with his army than it was for those other armies up north to move out. And that was kind of the thinking uh, behind that. One other thing, while you've got the uh, slide up here, uh, two of the battalion commanders was Abrams, as you talked about. Uh, could you make a comment about uh, General Erzig, ah, the other battalion commander, yeah. who um, is still living in Miami? Yes, uh, he is uh, an absolutely wonderful, uh, wonderful source. Uh, I ended up spending, I don't know how many hours talking on the phone with him. His memory is sharp as a tack. Uh, and you've probably seen him. If you've seen the greatest tank battles, who's ever seen the greatest tank battle series? He's on there. Uh, and he, his memory is incredibly accurate, very sharp. And uh, what's interesting about him was he was a battalion commander at 25 years old. Okay, something you you know you just don't see that uh, anymore. Uh, he was a major at the time, and he had just taken over the battalion. Yeah, pre previous to that, he had been the S3 for the 8th Tank Battalion. And 8th Tank Battalion was in Combat Command B. Um, and uh, uh, it was him, uh, Harold Cohen, who was the Armored Infantry Battalion Commander for the 10th Armored Infantry. And they fell under the command of Brigadier General uh, uh, Dager, uh, Holmes Dager. And they were the, that was this unit that came up through here. And originally, uh, General Gaffey, who was the uh, 4th Armored Division Commander, felt that this uh, attack was probably the one that was going to actually break through to Bastogne. And so, on the 23rd, they were up here, okay? And the reason why that's important is, I mean, if you think about it, on the 23rd, CCR was down here, okay? And then CCA was only about to about right here. So it looked like they were going to be the first ones to get to Bastogne. And they get to Chaumont, and in this area right here, you had the 14th uh, Fallschirmjäger Regiment uh, under the command of uh, Arno Schimmel, who was actually just a Luftwaffe a, a staff officer who had basically said, okay, you're no longer going to be living the cushy life. You're going to now be a regimental commander for a Falschmager unit. And he had several companies uh, in the Chaumont area. One of them was the uh, 7th Company, and then the other one was the 8th Company. Uh, and so the 8th Company was the weapons company in a typical Falschmager battalion. So you only had about two companies there, and all of a sudden, here comes Combat Command B rolling up this road. On the morning of December 23rd, they come rolling up the road, and leading the way uh, is a recon platoon, it's several jeeps. Uh, there's a light tank with them. Um, and they're going up this road, and the Germans are basically waiting for them in ambush. And that's actually how the book starts out, is that actual opening scene. The Germans then spring the ambush. They wipe out uh, uh, the two jeeps relatively quickly. And there are actually some photos. There's some photos in the book. Uh, it's a famous photo. The Jeep is literally burned out, and they are literally, it's graphic, but they're literally human body parts hanging in the tree, okay? And the beech tree is what it's called, is actually still there today. Uh, and there's a local resident, um, Don knows him, I Ivan, don't. and uh, they've actually saved the beech tree. The beech tree is still there, and there's a plaque there that talks about what had happened there. And so, Word gets back to Erzik, Major Erzik, hey, the Germ we found the Germans. Um, they're right here. And so Erzik then prepares this massive, uh, we like to call it deliberate attack. He, you know, he, he establishes a support by fire position, allocates the infantry, calls in the artillery. They then, you know, right around midday, he initiates the assault. You know, artillery comes in, pounds the city. And well, the town is not really a city, it's actually just a couple buildings. They then lead the attack. The attack begins, and it takes about several hours, okay, and they clear the village. It's now getting close towards 4 p.m. in the afternoon, a little bit after 4 p.m. And they're like, we've done it, we've cleared the village. And Urzik's like, I'm, this is my first major operation as a battalion commander, woohoo, I've done it. 
I'm the greatest officer ever. And, and all of a sudden, he starts taking counterfire, okay? And he doesn't know where it's coming from. And it's heavy. It's bad. And literally, left and right, Sherman start brewing up, okay? And in that course of that action, he ends up losing 11 tanks in a matter of minutes. Uh, and I remember asking him, I said, did you actually see what was firing at you? He said, no, but I know something was firing at me because my tanks are blowing up from everywhere. And what had happened was when he took the town, uh, the survivors literally retreated pell-mell up through here towards the southern half of Bastogne. And they literally ran by the division headquarters of the 26th Volksgrenadier Division. And if you remember what we were talking about last night, General Cocott was the division commander of the 26th Volksgrenadier Division. He ran, and he wrote a very lengthy account. He literally comes out of his, uh, his, his office, or his division command post, and he sees all these Fallschirmjägers streaming by. And, they're, and, they're, and they're, like I said, they're broken. They're a defeated force. They're running by. And he's like, you know, what's going on here? And of course, typical German officer, he starts trying to organize it and put it back into order. And so he starts asking him, and he's like, what's going on? And they're like, well, we got tanks coming. They're American tanks. They're going to be here. And if they hadn't stopped, they were literally minutes away. And so he was able to reorganize this force. And remember, these guys don't even belong to him. It's a different division. He reorganizes this force. And lo and behold, as he's standing there, and out of nowhere, a platoon of four Tiger tanks just come rumbling through his town. And he's like, you know, it was one of the few times that fortunes filed, smiled on the Germans. And he basically, there was a major uh, leading this platoon. And uh, he basically grabs these four Tiger tanks and says, hey, you guys, you're coming with me. And of course, you know, uh, you know Cocott's a general major at this point, so you're not going to tell this general no. I'm, I'm, I belong to someone else. And so he grabs these four Tiger tanks and organizes a counterattack. And that's what actually hits uh, uh, Major Erzik's column on the afternoon, of early evening of the 23rd. These four tanks, there's like a piece of high ground up here. And these four tanks basically establish what we call a, uh, an attack by fire position. And they get into this, uh, on the top of this ridge line. And if you guys know, the Tiger tanks have these things called these long barreled 8.8 .8 centimeter, 88 mil uh, millimeter guns. And so they're going to have much better standoff. They're going to actually be able to outrange anything that Major Urzik has, because all he has is the standard 75 millimeter and then a couple 76 millimeter Shermans. And so he starts plucking them away. He ends up taking out 11 of them. And, sh and of course, Urzik is forced to retreat. And then one of the guys, it's a funny little story. One of the veterans I interviewed was a Matteo Damiano, who was in Charlie Company, 10th Armored Infantry Battalion. And he vividly remembers that counterattack, because he he remembers all of a sudden things literally just start blowing up everywhere. And he remembers uh, his battalion commander, uh, Major Cohen, who became Colonel Cohen, literally running by just saying, get out, counterattack. And uh, it was funny because he, I, he, I sent him a book. And he goes, why did you send me this book? And he goes, well, you, you, I interviewed you. And he's like, wow, I'm in this book. This is great. You know? And so he was all excited. And so he wanted me to send co copies to his grandkids. But he very, very vividly remembers that counterattack and how it went down. It was. It was, he said it was one of the worst harrowing moments of his life, but he was lucky and he survived. Uh, we actually had to cancel a tour for, for the round table two years ago because we didn't get enough sign-ups. But if people will twist my arm, I'll try to put it together again in uh, uh, 17. But uh, this Otto uh, and, and General Erzig had lined up that we were actually going to have a ceremony with the, the villagers at Shermont. And they've now dedicated the uh, town plaza. It's the General Erzig oh, plots. Oh, yeah. yeah, no, yep. So, uh, yeah. Another question from one of our experts here. I'm not certain about expert, but enthusiast. Uh, thank <laughs> okay. you, Leo, for coming and, and Don last night. It was a wonderful program. I've got sort of a two-part question. Okay. I, I love talking about tank battles. As a tanker, I'd love to hear about uh, long-range shots and brewing up. But this is playing to your strong suit on military intelligence. So the opening question is, U.S. military doctrine on military intelligence doctrine right now in, in 1944, and then uh, Colonel Koch and his methodology. Was there something like intelligence preparation of the battlefield or environment that the U.S. Army used regularly 
in combination with Ultra, or is Coke extraordinary in his ability to see things problem-solving, skullduggery, um, in, in that essence, for, for your story today? Yeah, I would definitely say that the idea of coming up with a most dangerous course of action and understanding the implications behind that was definitely Coke's, that was Coke's thing, that was Coke's contribution um, to uh, intelligence preparation of the battlefield. Um, the Intel branch, as it is, is actually relatively new for the U.S. Army. Uh, usually, it was, there was no Intel branch even in World War II. It was kind of farmed out to different, uh, different agencies. A lot of your Intel guys tended to come from the, uh, the cavalry units. Coke being a perfect example of that. He was originally coming up prior to World War I was in the cavalry unit. I think it was like a Wisconsin you know, National Guard cavalry unit. Uh, because the cavalry did the scouting, cavalry you know, went out. And that was part of their job. They did the reconnaissance. And so that's where a lot of your intel guys originally came from. Um, all your signal intelligence came from the signal corps. It, wasn't, it didn't fall under uh, MI because there was no MI branch. And it really wasn't until after World War II uh, the Army said, you know, well, we've got to make something separate. And it's, it's interesting because it's very different from, like, the British Army where military intelligence has a long history as a separate, as a separate uh, corps. And the U.S. Army was kind of like, eh, you know, these are the guys who can't make it as, you know, infantry officers. Um, uh, and so they kind of got short shrift. Um, but I think that was one of the reasons why. And Coke really did. He is kind of, there's interesting, we have this, it's like a deck of cards. And in this deck of cards is kind of like the fathers of U.S. military intelligence. And uh, Coke is one of them. I mean, he really is. Uh, you know, in terms of how we look at IPB today and the idea of coming up with the most dangerous course of action, he really was one of the guys that said, yeah, you got to start thinking not just intentions, you got to look at what is the enemy capable of doing. Um, because if he is capable of doing that, as a planner, you have to take in that into account. And when you start doing your own courses of action, you do course of action development, which is step three of MDMP, which you would <laughs> know about, sir. Uh, you have to take that into account. And so that was, that was definitely his contribution, I believe. So should we understand that Patton really is a talent scout, looking for guys that have special experience, maybe not training, but they've got a special proclivity or a talent to do these kind of things and predict the future? Oh, I agree. I, I think uh, Patton was famous for taking... Uh, subordinates, staff officers, and really getting 150% out of them. And, you know, we tend to see the Patton, you know, the high-pitched, screaming type officer. And the reality of it was his bark was about 100 times worse than his bite. His staff officers, his subordinate officers, almost, you know, without question, had all kinds of respect for him. And not only that, he created a command environment and this is important where, you know, you've probably been in those command environments where you're afraid to talk to the boss and you're afraid to give him bad news and say, hey, boss, you know, you know that thing you want to do, we can't do it. Um, that did not exist. I mean, the fact that Colonel Coke could go up to Patton and say, you know that big offensive you were planning? It's probably not going to happen because the Germans are going to do this. And he, he created that kind of a command environment where his staff officers felt that comfortable enough to bring him that kind of news. And as you, know, you would know, that's a big deal because you've been in those situations where I don't want to talk to this guy and I'm just not going to tell him because I don't want to deal with you know, the, the yelling and the screaming. And uh, his staff officers, especially by the end of the war, because Bradley actually said that originally Patton's staff wasn't very good, but I would say uh, by the end of the war he had, some, you know, he had one of the best staffs uh, in the Army. And as a result of that, he also had really good subordinate commanders. Um, you know. Tiger Woods, who was the original, not Tiger Woods, a great golfer, but uh, P. Woods was the uh, original division commander, 4th Armored Division, and he was a great division commander. And, of course, there was a lot of controversy when Patton had to relieve him. But that's a whole other story. Um, but he also had a lot of great division commanders and a lot of good corps commanders, and they were able to exercise their command. Patton was very good at saying, this is what I want you to do, and I'm not going to tell you how to do it. Just go figure it out. And what's interesting is, uh, the, the Corps commander who was in charge of this was a General Milliken. He was Third Corps. Milliken was actually relatively new to Corps Command. Um, this was his first major combat operation as the commander of Third Corps. And so Patton initially violated his command philosophy. He really was initially in Milliken's uh, backyard, constantly making sure that Milliken was doing the right thing because, you know, he was a new commander. <laughs> 
This was kind of a big deal. Um, you know, it was important for his officer evaluation report, his OER. <laughs> so he didn't want to make sure Milliken screwed it up. And so initially, he was caught, and it's interesting because I have the radio logs, and you keep on getting calls from uh, um, Lucky Six, and Lucky Six was Patton's call sign. And so it'd be Lucky Six wants to know this, Lucky Six wants to know this. And then starting like around the 23rd, it went away. And he was no longer calling uh, Monarch Six, which was uh, Milliken's call sign. And he was always, because initially Lucky Six was always asking about what's the status of Olympic Six. And Olympic Six was 4th Armored Division. And, you know, right after about, about the 20, midway point to the 23rd, Patton stopped calling. And so he kind of purposely takes himself off the stage to let his commanders do what they were supposed to do. And then from basically the 23rd through the 26th, you know where you see Patton? He's talking about, remember our veteran yesterday? He's literally driving around checking on the troops. And we've got accounts from soldiers who'd be like, I remember when Patton showed up to tell me I got turkey coming. And, um, and it was that kind of thing where he was just driving out there, just like they showed in the movie where they show him in the Jeep as the soldiers are marching by him in the snow. That's what he was doing. He was driving around. He already had enough faith in the officers that they were doing the right thing. They were executing the mission. And now he was just doing what good leaders do, showing himself so the, the, the soldiers could see him for morale. And it worked. And uh, that's why he was the successful commander that he was. So, Question here. Yeah, as an old SIG enter, uh, why wasn't the radio silence more of a factor? Uh, that, they that's did, a huge light bulb. Uh, yeah, no, they did, uh, they did talk about it. There was mention of it, um, you know, why there wasn't there a lot of, why wasn't there a lot of chirping going on. Um, but I'd say the biggest thing they did wrong was what we call the mirror imaging. And a lot of the intel guys were like, hey, in our opinion, the war is over with. The German officers probably think the same thing. And so they were constantly coming up with reasons why things were happening and to explain it away basically but yeah there was there was a radio silence not only was there a radio silence there was also a lot of uh, the Germans cut down on a lot of their reconnaissance in the areas where they were going to do the attack because they didn't want to give away that they were they were planning on stuff and so that was also and there were people saying why are the Germans not patrolling anymore what's going on here and a lot of people just kept on coming up with reasons to discount it and was our air superiority, was that a false sense of security in, um, to an extent? Not so much a false sense of security in the sense that uh, the biggest problem here was the weather was so bad, so there weren't getting a lot of air reconnaissance. But the air reconnaissance that, that they were getting was showing that there was a lot of activity going on. Like I was talking about with the rail traffic uh, at the railheads along the Rhine, that there was definitely something, in, you know, the Germans were planning something. Yep. Quick family question. Uh, my wife's got a lot of relatives down in Kansas named Coke and uh, 35th Infantry Division, Kansas National Guard, part of Patton's Third Army. Mm -hmm. Was Coke a Kansas boy? Do you know? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to, I, I, didn't, I didn't go that back that far in terms of his biography. Well, I'm going to ask if she knows yeah. Coke. So it could be. I don't know if it's the same ones or the Coke brothers. Who knows? <laughs> so. <laughs> I don't know if it's related, but could you tell us uh, at the end of Bastogne when things had kind of had kind of quieted down, how far was it from where the Third Army was to where the Russians were coming into Germany from the east? About in miles or oh, days God. or um, so, yeah, we were talking you know chunks, huge yeah. chunks of miles. I mean, to kind of put it in perspective, this right here, you're only talking about. Uh, from down here, about 15, 20 miles, you know, this, this you know, give you some scale. And you're probably going, wow, that's not very far. I mean, that's basically my morning commute. Well, you know, the Germans had a lot of stuff in there. Uh, but well, no, you're talking several hundred miles. Well, the reason I wonder is when I was a kid at, at the end of the war, a friend of my dad's came home from Europe. He was in Patton's army. And he... Uh, stayed at our house for a few days mm -hmm. after he came back from overseas and he said that and this is allegoric i suppose but he said that uh, a lot of the guys thought we had to turn our tanks east <laughs> Patton had no love lost for the russians that is definitely true um and uh you know and and, and ironically that did later on after especially in the post where you know Patton being Patton was outspoken and he was getting into trouble saying things about the Russians, so. 
Yeah. And, the, and the movie does bring that out pretty well, actually. Uh, Patton and, and Hitler had two things in common. They hated the communists. Yeah. 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 Hey, you mentioned that, that you had a Luftwaffe major who'd come in. Mm -hmm. it, was the command structure such that the, the uh, German parachute troops reported through the Luftwaffe? Yes, they, they, they actually fell underneath the Luftwaffe. Okay, and I guess my, the question I really have is, it seems we have SS, Wehrmacht, mm -hmm. and Luftwaffe mm -hmm. ground troops mm -hmm. running. What, what kind of impact did that have on, on you know, command and control it, of it, what's going on? It, in certain instances, it had a huge impact. In other instances, it was minimal. Um, it depended on who the senior commander was. Uh, in this case, the 7th Army commander was a, was a regular uh, Wehrmacht guy, Brandenburger, Eric Brandenburger. Um, and, there, you know, there wasn't really that much of an issue in terms of taking orders. Uh, the uh, overall General Heilman, who was the 5th Falschmeier Division Command, was actually very good. He was a very good commander. Uh, he did a lot of fighting in Italy. Uh, so he was very, very familiar with U.S. and British tactics. Um, he had three regiments. The 13th and the 14th had garbage commanders. They were, like I said, they were staff guys. They were said, okay, you know, there's no need to have a staff anymore because we don't have much of an Air Force at this point. You're now going to be a Fallschirmjäger commander. The 15th guy, uh, 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 Groschi, Oberst Groschi, he was actually a full-fledged uh, Fallschirmjäger uh, uh, commander. And the 15th regiment was the long here, and they actually probably fought the best of the three regiments. They really caused a lot of problems uh, for 4th Armored Division. Uh, and they were tough. They were very tough. So. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, Montgomery in the north mm -hmm. and just kind of passed over quickly that he wasn't considered capable of turning south very quickly. Mm -hmm. And I've read some books recently about the very negative opinion that a lot of the American and uh, allied people, other than the British, had of Montgomery. Okay. Is there uh, any fair evaluation of Montgomery's strengths and weaknesses, unbiased? Um. I think uh, if he had any strengths, no, I no, he he was no, he did, he did, he did, and you got to remember there was a couple things that were going on uh, at this point, and and backgrounds are huge. Uh, Montgomery, like a lot of senior British officers, were survivors of the First World War. They were survivors of places like the Somme, where you know, and they really did lose literally like an entire generation of soldiers, and so Montgomery. It was a very important to him. It's not that you know Americans were callous about American lives, as we know they're not. But he was. It was the idea that I cannot afford to lose men. I can't go half cocked into an operation. The British Empire, the United Kingdom, just does not have the manpower. And it really was the case. Uh, in September of '44, uh, you really started to see the British having an inability to replace their losses because they were literally running out of people. Um, I think it was like only several thousand replacements came into the British divisions uh, in, in September of 1944. That's why Market Garden hurt as badly as it did. You know, you took uh, 1st Airborne Division for all practical purposes was wiped out. And it, and it never got reconstituted. It was gone. And that's because they just did not have the manpower. And so Eisen, uh, excuse me, Montgomery was all about lengthy preparation to make sure that I've whittled down the enemy as much as possible before I commit offensive forces. And so you have to kind of keep that in mind. Um, that was where his background from. And Patton uh, and those generals did not have that same World War I experience. Patton, of course, was uh, one of the uh, architects of the, you know, the, the U.S. Armor Tank Corps in the First World War. And so he didn't have, his life experience wasn't colored by that. Um, and I think that has a huge impact. You can't uh, you know, give that any, you have to really take that into account when you look at the British philosophy 
versus the American philosophy. We weren't, we didn't have that traumatic experience of the First World War or Verdun or the Somme. And so we were much more willing to do operations with a lot less planning. Patton was no exception to that. I mean, he literally, when he said he bounced the Rhine in March, I mean, there was literally like, I'm just going to cross the Rhine now. And boom, and he was off before the British. And of course, if you know anything about Operation Varsity, Montgomery had all kinds of prior planning. And it was just going to be this huge set piece operation. And Patton was just like, well, whatever. I'm just going to cross right now. And he did it. Um, but that was why, and I really think you, you really have to take that into account into why he was considered slow. And what's interesting is the German commanders, if you were to ask the German commanders, and there's all kinds of, the, I have uh, several friends who are former British Army officers, and they get really mad when I say this, but the German commander said Patton was the better general. Um, and, uh, and it was one of the reasons why was because Patton was, he just moved a lot quicker. Um, and it was much harder to predict what Patton was going to do. Now, there are British apologists who say, well, the, the, you know, the German generals were just saying that because they were in US jail cells being interrogated by US officers. And there might be some truth to that. But the fact that if that is the case, they did a pretty good job of planning their story because they were all saying it. And so I, I, I disagree with that. I do, I do think that the German, uh, the German field marshals and the German generals really did think that Patton was the bigger problem. Um, not as early as the movie shows, because they talk about they were talking about Patton in '43. That really wasn't the case. But after, certainly after he ran across France in, four, in the summer of '44, they were definitely worried about Patton. And Brandenburger, who was the Seventh Army commander, was talking about, you know, when the Germans came up with uh, the Automist plan, and he was like, "What are you going to do, you know, about my southern flank? Where is it? Down here." And they were like, well, you're going to stop Patton with a couple divisions. And he was like, you're nuts. That's not going to happen. And, he, he, and so he, by that point, especially by that point, they were worried about Patton. Patton was the guy they were concerned with uh, on the Western Front. But, but one of the things that you, you've got to keep in mind in December of 44 with respect to Montgomery, he had just shot his wad in, in Market Garden. Yeah, he did. Uh, he was in Eisenhower's doghouse because, yep. in, uh, you know, uh, he had to convince Eisenhower to do Market Garden. And when, when it was a partial failure, I mean, yep. the Americans succeeded. The, the British were the failures. And uh, <clears throat> Montgomery said he was 90% successful, by the way. What's that? Montgomery said he was 90% successful. The, the, the American part of it. Yeah. <laughs> and the 104th. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, one, one of the other things I'd like to have you comment on, uh, and, and we'll, we'll stop here briefly, <clears throat> but tagging on to the uh, post-Christmas uh, in, in the bulge, Nordwin happened. Could you just make a couple of comments on Nordwin? Well, it, and it's, it's going to be a couple, just simply because I, you know, my, my breadth of knowledge doesn't extend that far to uh, Operation Nordwin. Basically, the Germans had a plan, and it would have been... I have to go way back on the map here uh, to cut through here uh, with a smaller operation. Um, and it really was, it was supposed to be in conjunction. They actually had three parts on it. There was also initially a plan to bring 15th Army Group down from the north here. Yeah, it never got, it never got very far beyond the planning stages, but that was the original plan, was to lock in the 1st Canadian and the 2nd British Army up here. Um, and then, of course, uh, down here with uh, Army Group G in Nordwind. Um, Nordwind was basically, they, they understood that Patton was potentially going to be the one that was going to pull out and thereby weaken the Allied lines here. And so they were going to then plan an attack once Patton had pulled out and it was going to hit uh, US, the U.S. 7th Army, which was under uh, General Patch. He was the U.S. 7th Army commander. And as you also know, that obviously didn't work very well because we don't talk that much about it. And it, it, they didn't get very far. Not even, you know, and the bulge, as you can see here, that was the actual f furthest extent of the bulge. It never even got anywhere near that in terms of the German penetration. It got stopped pretty quickly, pretty soon. But yeah, all that fighting was in the first couple weeks of January. Um, what they also all talk about was Operation Bodenplatt, which was like the last hurrah, the Wolfluffa. They flew like several thousand sorties on uh, January 1st to hit all the Allied airfields. Um, and they ended up destroying several hundred Allied aircraft. But the reality of it was, 
it really wasn't a fair trade because, yeah, you destroyed the aircraft on the ground, but at this point in the war, where the Allies are literally building like a B-24 an hour at Willow Run uh, plant in outside Detroit, that was a drop in the bucket. And what the real problem was, the Germans couldn't replace the pilots that they lost. In the Boeing pilots flight. and the fuel. Yeah, they, they couldn't replace those guys. Whereas for the Allies, it was like, eh, so we lost some aircraft. You know, it'll disrupt us for a couple of weeks, but we, you know, and by the end of January, they were back in you know, full swing, and that was pretty much that. So. Well, listen, let's stop it here. It's a little bit after one. Uh, come up and uh, uh, tell this guy what a what, son. <laughs> what a great young man he's done. What a great history he's uh, done. And we look forward to uh, uh, other uh, research and books from you. Yeah. Thanks for coming to Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions.